Hello and welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Rafif Ziada. I am a lecturer in the politics department here at uh, SOAS, University of London, and I will be moderating our event tonight. Um, I'm very excited to welcome you to the fifth event in the SOAS University of London, continuing the conversation series. SOAS will be hosting more virtual events as the month comes along. Uh, today's event will be recorded. Please use the following hashtags to discuss or follow. Hashtag SOAS, SOAS alumni, or we are SOAS. Today's event um, is with assistant professor and actor and she will be discussing U.S. and Palestine shoot to kill policies and transnational resistance. This is a very timely conversation and it is very exciting and a pleasure for me to be introducing Noura. Noura will present for about 20 minutes and then we will have a question and answer session. Please submit your questions in the chat box to the side. Um, we cannot get to all of the questions, but I will try my best to get to most of them. Introducing um, Noura for all of you tonight, most of you would know her who are familiar with this topic. Noura is a human rights attorney and an assistant professor at Rutgers University, New Brunswick, in the Department of Africana Studies and the Program in Criminal Justice. Her research interests include human rights law, humanitarian law, national security law, refugee law, social justice, and critical race theory. Noura is a co-founding editor of the famous blog Ajadalia, an electronic magazine on the Middle East that combines both scholarly expertise as well as local knowledge. She is the author of the excellent Justice for Some, Law and the Question, law in, in the Question of Palestine, Stanford University Press, which is the winner of the 2019 Palestine Book Award, sponsored by the Middle East Monitor, and the winner of the Independent Publishers Book Awards Bronze Medal in Current Affairs current and foreign affairs. It is my pleasure to welcome Noura. We will have the conversation and turn to your questions. Noura, over to you. Great, okay, fantastic. Take two. Um, I was saying what an honor it is to be with you, Doctora, um, and uh, sister Rafif Ziade. It's an honor to be here with the SOAS community. Um, I want to, I'm going to be reading my remarks for the sake of time, especially because there's so many events unfolding that you know, bear more critical analysis that are not part of this discussion. So I want to leave room. Uh, for that conversation. Um, I the, the purpose of this talk and, and the theme of it was um, to think about transnationalism, transnational solidarity, but also transnationalism as a practice um, and, a, and a theoretical approach how we understand state violence. Um, and in doing that, one of the things that you know, I'm confronted with this, you know, for me, transnationalism is a contemporary iteration of internationalism. Historically, and internationalism, as I understand it, is, a, is an anti-imperialist framework, an analytical framework um, of understanding the world through an anti-imperial lens. So thinking through that, having that hold this conversation, I want to think about um, contemporary forms of state violence in the United States and Palestine, and specifically um, the, the phenomenon of shoot to kill. To have this conversation, I'm going to start from the very personal because um, um, my family, like many Palestinian families and marginalized communities, um, has um, lost a beloved um, member of our family as a result of shoot to kill policy. So I'll start from there in the personal to, to, to think through what does transnationalism do for us in this moment? What does it reveal about racism in Palestine? What does it reveal about colonialism in the United States? My cousin Ahmed uh, Arikat is a 27-year-old young man with a screening t-shirt business, a fiance and a future. Um, he was on a journey from Abu Dis to Bethlehem on June 23rd, running errands for his sister's wedding, um, eager about two months ago. He rented a Hyundai 
that has since been revealed is the uh, subject of a class, an international class action lawsuit indicating motor um, malfunction and this inexplicable um, tendency of the Hyundai vehicle to jerk out of control. That is precisely what happened with Ahmed as he waited at um, the container checkpoint that separates Abu Dis from Bethlehem two Palestinian cities, it bears to be noted that so many of the demarcations that are inscribed by Israel's um, settler colonial apparatus, though framed as security measures, are actually intended to fragment, isolate, um, and separate Palestinians from one another. Uh, as Ahmed waited at that checkpoint, when he was called to approach, his car jerked out of control and he hit uh, four soldiers who were there, all fully armed. One of them was knocked to the floor, and as we saw in video, quickly gets right back up on her feet in enough time to witness her fellow soldier shoot seven rounds of live ammunition into Ahmed's body, who had stepped out of the car, raising his arms, indicating that he had no arms, and taking a step back. Uh, watching that, I can't describe it in any, in any other way, uh, besides the horror of having to watch that in real time, um, watching him wilt, literally like a flower onto the asphalt. Once he's on the ground, he's bleeding out. And there is, he's, he's, not, he's not shot dead immediately. There was an opportunity to save his life. When the Israeli ambulance approaches in order to treat the Israeli soldier who's only lightly wounded, they decline to treat Ahmed. Though now they've told Human Rights Watch and others otherwise, we understand from the first iteration from witnesses that they declined to treat Ahmed. The soldiers also refused access to um, a Palestinian ambulance to treat Ahmed, um, at, and they refused access to his father, uh, Mustafa, who arrived on the scene as well, then forcing him to bleed out for over an hour before he died. Immediately afterwards, they compounded the car, they confiscated Ahmed's body. They placed it in a morgue um, at Tel Aviv uh, University in the Queensberg Forensic Institute and have refused to release it uh, now for over 80 days. We're talking two and a half months for over 80 days. And I cannot uh, tell you how much we as a um, few individuals in the family have organized ourselves. Um, it's, it's, it's a joke. It's absurd to say that we're seeking justice for Ahmed. There is no justice in this situation beyond the full liberation of Palestinians. Um, Palestinians understand that Ahmed is unfortunately one of many. Our, our hope is that he be the last. And already we know he's not the last because others have been killed since June 23rd. One in captivity, in detention, and another one um, um, near his home during an Israeli raid. Uh, two young men now remain in critical condition. So we failed to do even that. But the other work that we've been doing is just to release Ahmed's body from capt captivity. Um, we've filed a submission at the United Nations with 87 co-sponsoring organizations addressing five special repertoires. We filed a petition against Tel Aviv University calling for boycott, indicating once again the imbrication of the academy and Israel's settler colonial regime um, and the fact that you can't necessarily take the university out claiming some sort of objectivity when the entwinement is so clear um, and obvious. Um, we've organized Arakat um, family members who reside in the United States to lobby six U.S. senators uh, to, to directly um, impose and pressure Israeli authorities to release Ahmed's body as a humanitarian exception. We have not only failed on that front, but we think that that may have um, been counterproductive as those who were appealed to have made, have since then made the policy even more um, harsh, which I'll tell you in a minute. We've obviously launched a media strategy and uh, retained an attorney with Adala, Adala attorneys to represent the family at the Israeli High Court to release the body. Upon the hearing in July, the High Court responded that the government had provided no justification for withholding the body and has two weeks to do so. It has since been a month and a half and they have not only failed to provide a justification, right? And this was on just, just to let you know the depths of violence, on the 33rd day of captivity after death, the high court said to the government, you haven't provided a justification, which makes you wonder how have you held on to his body for 33 days without having to tell anybody why you do that, right? Um, 
but since then, rather than provide a justification, now the um, Minister of Defense, Benny Gantz, who is incorrectly and inaccurately has been considered the liberal uh, alternative to Likud um, Netanyahu, he is representing the black and white, par uh, black, uh, blue and white party, um, made the policy more harsh so that no Palestinian bodies can be released under any circumstances. Instead, they want to retain them um, to do a prisoner exchange with Hamas specifically for the bodies of two Israeli soldiers uh, who are now held in the Gaza Strip. Putting aside the fact, um, and I'm pinning it, you can ask me in the Q&A, but even this e equivalence between um, the, the now 67 bodies held at Tel Aviv University and the two Israeli soldiers held by Hamas, there is no equivalence. It's a false equivalence and one that is, is deliberately obscuring the power um, disparity and, and what might be considered you know, an irregular armed conflict. But ask me questions about that later. For now, I want to, you know, uh, just highlight that in the course of this ordeal, which was, um, I, I did receive a, a lot of attention, especially because Ahmed's uh, killing was caught on camera, as well as his slow death was caught on camera. Um, and many, many allies and friends reached out to encourage me to draw the parallel with uh, the movement for black lives in the United States. We are in the midst of one of the most significant black uprisings in uh, U.S. history. It has reverberated across the globe. There are solidarity demonstrations in at least 18 countries across the entire uh, continental United States, as well as um, occupied territories of Hawaii and Puerto Rico. There, um, Sweden has issued a weapons uh, weapons sanctions on the United States. It will not transfer tear gas to the U.S. in response uh, to its behavior. And this issue has also been taken up by um, UN various U.N. tribunals, indicating once again the international nature of white supremacy and the threat that it poses uh, to, to, to the whole world as the authors of the 1951 submission, we charge genocide, uh, the uh, American blacks accused the United States of genocide against uh, their population in 1951 once that legal framework had crystallized in a post-World War II order. Um, they indicated in that submission that um, white supremacy threatens to become uh, the impetus for fascism in the United States and across the globe, and thereby threatens world security in the same way that the rise of the Third Reich in Germany and Nazi ideology indeed threatened world security and destabilized it. Um, and, and we are bearing out their very prescient um, analysis. Um, because of the way that we understand and have accepted the that white supremacy is just wrong and that black uprising is just, there was an appeal, a personal appeal to me to draw the parallel between Ahmed's killing, um, you know, an unarmed killing, you know, comparing him to, to Eric Garner or comparing him to Michael Brown, who was also left to bleed out for four hours in Ferguson's summer heat in August 2014 before his family as a form of terror, state terrorism against the family and the um, black community. And because we understand that the idea was make the appeal to the American public, draw the comparison and explain to people this isn't about security, but that indeed Palestinian lives matter too. I obviously have not taken that appeal public, one, because being an ethical solidarity with black uprising, I didn't want in any way to inadvertently um, co-opt the conversation or detract from what, it's been 400 years. I mean, there's finally attention uh, to, 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 you know, the violent nature of white supremacy in the United States. There's high risk of drawing parallels, especially to Palestine, not developing in conversation and organically. That was one. The other reason I didn't want to do that was also because there's something to be said about the flatness of an analogy. What do we lose in making an analogy without, you know, bearing out its texture? And 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 what I want to do in this conversation is actually bear out that texture, flesh it out a little bit, because the analysis, um, Black Palestinian solidarity and a transnational analysis 
is incredibly illuminating, um, but not in the way of just indicating sameness or similarity, but in a way that urges us to think about what is the anti-racist dimension of Israel's um, settler colonial apartheid regime, what is the anti-colonial nature of the black liberation struggle. Um, I, I, I right, I obviously didn't stay on, on, on my writing, but I'm, uh, here I, I say that not all blacks, American blacks and Palestinians believe in black Palestinian solidarity, a lot of American blacks see their struggle as one for equality and making the US better so that it can reach its full potential as the United States. The second is that a lot of Palestinians see their struggle as a nationalist struggle against Israel, but not necessarily against US hegemony in the Middle East or against client Arab regimes or the extraction of natural resources in the region or the control over the region in order to compete with other colonial powers. This anti-imperialist analysis is a political orientation and not a matter of identity. As such, black Palestinian solidarity is not merely about sympathy with one another. It's literally a commitment to joint struggle for joint futures. And based on this, one of the things that it helps us do is bear out that analysis um, that I discussed. So on the first, what about, how do we think through the racialization of Palestinians? Since 2000, at the start of the second, what's known as the second Intifada, Israel has created a new category of war that has allowed it to use military force against Palestinians and made any Palestinian use of force terroristic and criminal. A central part of this approach has been a legal technology that I've called shrinking civilians, quote unquote shrinking civilians, which essentially shrinks the number of Palestinians considered civilians and thus, um, once you once you say that they're not civilians, they become legitimate targets of war. Otherwise, civilians are always immune and never targets of war. Um, the targeting of them is 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 considered terrorism, and the targeting of them um, ne negligently would be considered as collateral damage. And yet, what Israel has done with using legal technology that I'm happy to address is to actually use the language of law in order to shrink who gets counted as a Palestinian civilian. In doing so, they've expanded the permissible use of force that Israel can use, as well as the tolerance for the high registers of death and destruction of civilians and civilian infrastructure, as we've seen in multiple wars against the Gaza Strip, and then recently onslaughts against the Gaza Strip, and then re most recently in the Gaza March of Return, where Palestinians were shot to be shot to kill like birds, and I'll address that shortly. But on the shrinking civilian itself, it's predicated on the thorough racialization of Palestinians as innately dangerous subjects. Racial ideologies reflecting settler colonial desires to remove and replace the native populations render Palestinian bodies unwanted, and sanctions their killing with impunity. The native population is by definition terroristic and presumed guilty by virtue of its refusal to disappear. Thus, Palestinians are racialized as dangerous not because of how they may individually harm Israelis, but because their national existence challenges Israel's settler sovereignty. And the most obvious example of that is the fact that the right of return um, and the return of Palestinian refugees is framed as an existential threat um, to Israel. Most recently, as I mentioned, we saw this um, and how it was deployed against marchers in the Great uh, March of Return. Several human rights organizations challenged Israel's shoot to kill policy, where they basically set up snipers on the perimeter at a distance of 300 meters on hilltops around a territory that's already um, circumscribed by a militarized fence. And uh, the day before the protests began, in March 2018, the head of uh, uh, Gabi Eshkanot gate said that there will be, uh, excessive use of force will be deployed, right? So this was before they saw what the protests were going to be like, had already decided what kind of force that they would use. That was challenged in the Israeli high court as being an illegitimate use of force against civilian protesters, which the Great March of Return was. And yet the army, the Israeli government responded and said, no, this is not a civilian, this is this is not a civilian protest. 
there are no civilians. If they're there, they're, a ma they're there as a matter of exception. And in fact, the Israeli high court, upon hearing, agreed with the Israeli government and called the Great March of Return, quote, a new tactic in the struggle against Israel, end quote. Um, the court's acceptance of the state's agreement that Hamas led the protests overdetermined its conclusions and foreclosed the possibility of Palestinian civilian protests. This has had real consequences. Between March and October 2018, Israel killed 217 Palestinians, including 40 children, injured nearly 23,000. Um, and in response, Palestinians killed one Israeli soldier. Okay, so in any other reg legal register, this would be considered a disproportionate use of force, and yet under um, Israel's new legal technology, it becomes permissible in the language of law. Israel today defends Ahmed's killing and claims the right to use similar force against again, right? Not that they not that they defend what they did to Ahmed, but they insist that it was the right thing to do because it does not consider that Ahmed's car accident could have been human or mechanical error. Like nearly all Palestinians, he was considered always already guilty. It is based on the same Schmidtian logic of a priori culpability, which assumes that certain groups have greater propensity to violence or criminal behavior so that they should be stopped before they can strike. This logic, right, the Schmidtian logic, who is, you know, the infamous um, Nazi jurist who is also um, central to so many theories in, in national security law, but this logic of a priori culpability is at the heart of preemptive strikes, as well as stop and frisk, as well as the school to prison pipeline um, in the United States. By attributing social behavior to nature as opposed to environment, the problem is framed as the group itself and not the context. Hence, the target for, for remedy is the group through dialogue, through nonviolent trainings, through counter extremism workshops, through surveillance over securitization and cruel, cruel punishment and not the context that needs to be remedied. In the United States, we understand this attitude towards American blacks, but we stand to benefit from an anti-colonial analysis that brings you know, forth um, into light the colonial nature of white settler colonial rule in the US. Defined as a property value, whiteness can be understood as the right to ownership of land, of, this, of self, and of country. Race can thus be understood, as Patrick Wolf has shown, as colonialism speaking, a technology invented to ensure the externality of racialized subjects from the national body politic and their geographic separation and containment, right? So this is a colonial logic um, about the, the separation containment um, within um, uh, within the colony. In 1951, as I mentioned, uh, the Civil Rights Congress pre uh, presented to the UN the We Charge Genocide petition and explained that, quote, once the classic method of lynching was the rope, now it's the policeman's bullet, end quote. The policeman's bullet, like lynchings historically, uh, were used and are used as a form of collective punishment to ensure a rigid and hierarchical racial order aimed at preserving white supremacy in the United States. Black internationalists in the US have conceived of themselves as an internal colony whose conditions and futures mirrored those of all co other colonized peoples. These conditions aimed at limiting black life in the United States um, include ghettoization, exclusion from gainful employment, medical experimentation, forced sterilization, exclusion from quality housing, lack of access to quality healthcare, education, and credit, the systematic taking of life with impunity, and then finally, the criminal justice system, which features over-policing, racial profiling, selective enforcement, mass incarceration, disproportionate sentencing, lack of adequate representation, and hyper-surveillance, right? So what the overemphasis on policing in the United States and police brutality, um, what we miss in, in that critique, which the, is the rightful critique, is that policing is the end of, of, of really a, a much broader problem and works to do two things. It works both to exploit black communities in order to make them more vulnerable for um for for you know the takings of of their labor the takings of of their time the takings of their likelihood of life and then simultaneously uh works to make them more vulnerable for prosecution um and incarceration and basically formal captivity um all of this of course is to protect um, uh, uh, the privileges of a white racial class. And so similar to historic slave patrols, um, 
which in the United States was the first function of police, which was to enforce the Fugitive Slave Act uh, to capture uh, slave, uh, in, in, sorry, enslaved um, African Americans fleeing the juris juridical um, slave South to the North to capture them and return them to their um, um, enslavers. So like the police, like their function historically today, is merely the enforcement arm of a settler colonial political economy. Um, James Baldwin in 1966 highlighted that this was the primary role of police, which was to keep black people in their place. And then, you know, critiques the response to any black protest or black activity, specifically in Harlem, by describing Harlem as occupied territory. He writes, it is axiomatic in occupied territory that any act of resistance, even though it be executed by a child, be answered at once with the full weight of occupying forces. End quote. Indeed, black protests in the United States has historically and continues to be treated like an insurgency and reflects the steady militarization of police in the 20th century. So um, just so you have an idea, if you're paying attention to the protests in the United States from, from Portland to Kenosha, Wisconsin, uh, Kenosha, Wisconsin, Kansas City, Missouri, um, Chicago, and elsewhere, we see heavy, heavy military tactics that are being used. But this has a legacy that begins um, during the U.S.'s intervention in Vietnam, where it, it perfected counterinsurgency tactics that it then brought back to the United States um, and has manifested as SWAT teams specifically to count to, to squash uh, the Watts uprising in 1965 and later um, to squash what it described as the war on drugs, which has really been a war on black communities. Um, during the Vietnam War, the Johnson administration also passed the Safe Streets Act and allocated surplus weapons from Vietnam to U.S. cities to quash rebellions. And in 1990, Congress enacted the 1033 program, which also transfers excess military weapons from theaters of U.S. wars back to local precincts, all indicating um, uh, uh, the militarization of the police in, uh, in, 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 in suppressing uh, Black uprising and other people of color uprising, but primarily black uprising. Since September 11th, law enforcement has also been training in Israel, which is a continuation of this trend. The risk, you know, and many people have said, oh, the U.S. acts as it does because it was trained by Israelis. That, that, that's actually not true. That's actually not true. Yes, there has been an exchange of technologies. Yes, it indicates something worrisome, which is that Israel, which decries Palestinians as a foreign enemy, is training the U.S. on tactics to use against um, people of color and, and, and black communities, which are not a foreign enemy, except that's what we're being told. Um, but beyond that, what we do by... By, by sharing that inaccurate description of US law enforcement training in Israel is to obscure a colonial reality in the United States. Um, Trump has recently called these black activists, quote, terrorists, and he's not borrowing from a distant geographic experience, but he's continuing the trend of casting American blacks as enemy of the state. Hence, black protests as a national insurgency that justifies state violence both to quell and prevent them. Um, this has not been lost on anti-imperialist black activists who understand their condition as reflective of an international order. These activists are committed to scaling back US hegemony from the Middle East to Latin America and the Caribbean. So as they engage in black Palestinian solidarity, I think now as historically, it's really been engaged in a black internationalist tradition of understanding uh, the colonial nature of the United States and understanding that their fate is not tied to making the US live up to its potential as outlined in the Constitution, but actually shattering American exceptionalism and is a commitment to decolonize the US as it is to decolonize the rest of the world. Um, in, in solidarity with Palestinians in the US, um, activists have challenged technologies used by US prison systems in the Israeli military, like G4, G4S surveillance systems, the police exchange program, the one that I was just describing, and organized campaigns to end US military support to Israel which amounts to $3.8 billion a year, not merely, right? This, this is great to challenge that military aid. And part of the framing of challenging that military aid has been to say, well, if you're not 
funding these endless wars, you can actually be providing um, and, and making more robust a U.S. welfare state that would diminish the need of securitization of people. And that's, that's certainly true. But as scholar and activist Hudi Peterson-Smith has pointed out to me um, and others, when we think about scaling back the U.S. military abroad, we can also think about what is a future without military presence, right? That uh, that opens up for the possibility for us to imagine, you know, life outside of resistance to this to, to endless war and securitization. Um, these um, this work is both working to make prisons obsolete as well as to challenge um, U.S. imperialism, which has given rise to the hashtag defund police, hashtag defund military. And in doing so, activists have demonstrated how a vision aimed at global decolonization can be operationalized in local projects. Um, we've, we've seen this work already being done. Barbara Lee has proposed, uh, you know, slashing $350 million from the U.S. military budget. We've seen the Minneapolis uh, City, City Council disband the police. We've seen several different um, U.S. municipalities cut the budget of police, all of that is moving in the right direction. And, and what we've witnessed is basically a generational shift that's happened in the past few months in the United States uh, that's akin to other generational shifts, casting um, racism as, as an illegitimate system that have cast colonialism as an illegitimate form of governance. Um, so, you know, I want to just end that in, in this solidarity and in this work by bearing out, you know, by using Black Palestinian solidarity to both tease out an anti-imperialist framework that helps us um, recognize what racism might be doing and is not necessarily just redundant, but might be doing redundant with colonialism in Palestine, what colonialism is doing in the United States and may not be just redundant with racism um, in uh, the U.S. and all for the sake of insisting not upon programs to democratize and uh, democratize in the settler colony for greater integration, but in fact are aimed at a future of decolonization and a commitment to decolonial futures. Thank you. Thank you so much, Noura, for that very informative and moving and grounded um, discussion and presentation. We have some excellent questions already. As I mentioned earlier, I'm going to try and take as many questions as I possibly can. Uh, but if people can keep them to questions, um, or I'll try to reframe comments as questions as best as I can. Uh, one of the first questions I got was around the differentiation, or how do you weigh up the difference between the shoot-to-kill shoot policies versus the shoot to maim policies, um, as we saw in the Gaza Strip, of course. That's an excellent question. I think that, you know, both uh, both are operationalized along the spectrum of the availability of Palestinian bodies uh, for, for taking and for destruction, right? Um, I think that Jasper Puar has highlighted to us, you know, how a shoot to maim how a shoot to maim approach basically spares Israel uh, from a rebuke of, you know, actual um, killing, but and and makes it a, you know makes it appear as if it's somehow in compliance if they only maim in order to incapacitate Palestinians, which reifies a security framework and actually makes it appear as humanitarian. When in fact, um, I think both indicate the sheer disposability. Of, of Palestinian bodies, which which is predicated on you know a deeply racial um, analysis of 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 the potential of Palestinian humanity, and so obviously Palestinians reject that and and don't need to respond to it. But these are the messages um, that are sent. I think both need to be uh, critiqued just as much, for better or for worse. Um, it's the shoot to kill policies that are. Uh, what received the greatest amount of attention, but also as other abolitionists pointed out to us, like Derricka Purnell, upon the murder of, um, of George Floyd in Minneapolis, what if the cop only kept his knee on the neck of Floyd for seven minutes and 16 seconds instead of eight minutes and 16 seconds, right? He wouldn't have been killed, but he would have certainly been maimed. 
doesn't he still deserve the uprising um, that we are now witnessing? Are we just trying to tame uh, state forces into, into maiming rather than killing? Or is the vision for something completely different and more radical? Um, Alexandra is wondering if you could elaborate on the role of age and gender in shoot to kill policies, especially the criminalization of young men. Um, so I think one of the things that we see, and you're right to point out that um, so many of, of the victims are shot and killed without respect to gender or race, right? We've seen this, uh, sorry, gender or age. Um, we see this very, you know, as a, as a legal matter and the fact that Palestinian children are considered adults a year before Israeli children are considered adults. So even in here, you can see how legal technology is used to obscure these types of violence by mere, you know, an arbitrary designation of when somebody becomes mature. Um, that's on the face of it. But what we also see is a lack of distinction, a lack of distinction. Um, when I was discussing earlier this idea of a priori culpability, that concept is, is and I said it's at the heart of preventative, um, you know, preventive strikes or preemptive self-defense, right, or, or stop and frisk. At the heart of it is this idea that certain groups are racialized as born with a propensity to kill and a propensity to violence. So whether they be Palestinian adults or Palestinian children, in this framework, the Palestinian children will eventually become a Palestinian adult. And all along the way, the, the insistence is that they are going to be violent, right? So when we obscure and fail to distinguish even these categories, it's less about saying that children don't matter and more about insisting that Palestinian behavior can be attributed somehow to their nature rather than to the context in which they live, which separates them and distinguishes them from any other people that we would consider, um, uh, we would consider how they would react under similar circumstances. Suddenly they become exceptionalized and distinguished so that they no longer, we no longer analyze that behavior based on the circumstances, but basically on the logic of whether or not they are in fact um, inherently dangerous. Um, just to let the over 100 people that are with us right now know, we're going to be wrapping up in around 10, 15 minutes. So please put your questions in the chat um, so you can get the chance before we have to wrap up. Um, changing gears a little bit, here someone is asking about a comparison between Israel and what Arab regimes, uh, particularly the Syrian regime, has pointed out as what they do uh, to their own people. Uh, does that weaken the Palestinian cause or does it present it as one of many examples of abuse of human rights and state terrorism in the region? That's a great question. I mean, so let me, let me um, and it's very loaded, <laughs> obviously. So let me um, start by saying that one of the reasons that, you know, um, the question of Syria, I think, has been so, become so difficult uh, to deal with and engage in is because we, we, we have not left room for nuance to both understand, right, an anti-imperialist critique and hold that intention with what are unabashed state crimes and state violence and, you know, state terrorism against um, Syrian people. And I think that we should be able to hold that together. So um, does the next part of the question that I want to answer is that nothing that any state does, not least Israel, um, operates in a vacuum, but is actually reverberating in practice that can be uh, replicated and entrenched across uh, the globe. So for example, I mentioned uh, shoot to kill policies, but other forms of legal technology that we need to be really aware of that Israel has basically set in motion that was later adopted by the United States and has since been adopted by Saudi, Ara you know, the Saudi Arabia and its coalition against Yemen, as well as by the United Arab Emirates and even, you know, combating their own adversaries um, has been the idea of preventive force, right? And what they did there was to take self-defense here we go on a, a little bit of a legal tangent, but we, what they do is they self-defense has at least two meanings. One is the charter meeting in Article 51 of the UN Charter that describes it that you can only use force against another actor um, in the case of an armed attack. We'll
the customary definition of it doesn't require an armed attack, but requires that the use of force be necessary, proportionate, and imminent, right? And what Israel does um, in the start of the 2000s and in response to the Palestinian um, uprising known as the Second Intifada is to diminish the framework of imminence so that there's no longer a, a time, a temporal requirement in deciding when to kill somebody. So self-defense says that you can kill somebody when you have no other time to use other means to incapacitate, right? What Israel has done in its analysis is to say, we don't know when they're gonna attack, but we know that they're gonna attack for sure. So even if you kill them, right, these, sub these suspected assailants in their sleep, in bed, with their with their families in their home with their families that becomes justified because you're you're preventing something that was going to happen inevitably based on you know military intelligence that is not cannot be scrutinized by any other actors right the us has adopted this is this is why how we, they transform israel transforms extrajudicial assassinations into this neutered concept of targeted killings um, they were the progenitors of this, you know, lethal violence and legal technology that the United States adopts and and has been using, and in fact, it, it's taken to its apex in new form when the Obama administration uses it. The Obama administration uses it because now it's no longer capturing, um, you know, suspects in the theater of war and kidnapping them to bring them to Guantanamo Bay. And I say kidnapping deliberately as opposed to capturing because so many of the detainees in Guantanamo are not combatants. We're just civilians in the wrong place at the wrong time. And so in order to respond to that critique, the Obama administration of, of, of continuing that practice, which had been delegitimized within the American public, starts to shoot to kill, right? Starts using targeted assassination as a new policy, which is why we see the number of detainees diminish, but we also see the number of casualties rise. Well, that technology that Israel offered is offered um, to the world because it's actually a proposition for the creation of a new law of, of war and certainly not just um, by you know um, actors that we disdain, but also even by actors that we might otherwise, um, people might otherwise uh, defend. Um, just to, due to time limitation, I'll try to do two questions at, at one go here. Um, Shahid is asked first thanking you for your presentation, but then asking, is it still important to have international so power and try to pursue out. international Habib, you cut out. I, I, Can you hear me yeah. better now? Yes. Okay. Um, Shahid is thanking you for the presentation, and she's also asking whether you think it's still effective to continue to pursue international condemnation through the International Court and the UN, or whether we need to spend more time humanizing Palestinians in the Israeli eye to affect policy change. Um, the, sec yeah. the second question um, I think you were probably anticipating is the one around the recent UAE Bahrain normalization right. um, attempt and signature. Thank you. Um, so on the first question is a question of strategy. And I'll start by saying broadly that I actually, as someone who believes, you know, I'm 40 and I'm things um, got worse, they got better, they've gotten worse, and I'm just 40. So I can't imagine what's going to happen in the next 40 years if I'm given that life. Um, and I'm not sure that in my lifetime, you know, what this cycle will, will look like. So all of that to say is I believe in resistance. I believe in resistance in all the forms that it takes, regardless of whether or not we can demonstrate, you know, some sort of output, which is what, you know, a capitalist framework would have us believe that if you put input, there should be an output that you see. Oftentimes, as a form of input, we can't see the output manifest immediately um, and is is not right is not discernible, um, and so which is what gives to my very liberal reading. Of, I believe everything is good, right? I believe everything is good because we do not know the moment at which these various vectors will culminate um, and will be catalyzed into um, massive transformation, right? How many, unfortunately, how many black people have been murdered? Nobody could have anticipated that, you know, that, that, that the last murder of George Floyd, who was not the first nor the last, he has not been the last, 
uh, would be would be a catalyst, right? People had been organizing in Egypt for decades who knew that a turning point would come um, in, in 2011 and, and forward. So there are things that we can anticipate, which leads to, you know, my answer, which is to say that everything, everything um, should be pursued, but should be pursued in life. If we have, you know, a limited amount of resources, I don't know that I would ever want to explain to Israelis um, who negate my humanity that I'm human, right? As much as I believe in a decolonial future and that that decolonial future must involve Israelis who um, have to, you know, contend with a hi history of ethnic cleansing, removal of their settler sovereignty um, and violence, I also don't think it's incumbent upon any Palestinian um, to be doing that work. Uh, that, that, that There's a certain violence in that. It's almost like, what do you have to do to prove that you're human except that you were born, right? So maybe there I wouldn't do that. But in terms of the international fora, I see that as complicated because using international law is very risky. Um, it can inadvertently reify certain frameworks that are no longer, uh, no longer useful, right? Certainly the framework of occupation um, is increasingly not useful despite the fact that it is, it is the one thing that Palestinians have been able to build international consensus around. And yet now, the more that we engage in um, international legal accountability that challenges the occupation, how much are we obscuring um, an apartheid reality? We need to, maybe it's not the time, but we should be asking that question that there will be a time when the, that is in fact the case. I don't know that it that that it's right now it um, as I see that there's still useful ways to build on that consensus. Um, anyway, okay, so let me shift, and I just want to point out that Ardi MCs has just published an article that demonstrates why the occupation um, is actually illegal, which would be another way for us to think about it. The second question was about normalization. Here's what I'll say about normalization, and I've, I've said this a few times, so I'm just going to repeat myself. Um, this shows us. Uh, three things, I think. Number one, it reminds us that Palestine is part of a region and doesn't exist um, in a vacuum. Palestinians are part of a larger region that is also struggling against, um, you know, imperialism. And what we're seeing in this moment is the U.S. entrenching its sphere of influence by aligning in very explicit relations, Israel, the UAE, and Bahrain, and still more to come. Right. So it again should remind us that Palestinians have historically and continue to claim that the pathway to freedom um, and the pathway to Jerusalem flows through other Arab capitals who are also challenging despotic, tyrannical, violent regimes. And this this is this is a reminder of that. Number two, um, I think that the other thing that it it shows us is that, or that it reminds us is how the framework of peace has become such a violent framework. Because they tell us that this is a peace process, and what that does, it obscures the fact that the only reason Arab states have withheld normalizing relationships with uh, Israel is not in order to end hostilities. There are no hostilities. There are no ongoing hostilities between the UAE, Bahrain, and Israel. Right, but in fact, have withheld normalization as a carrot to incentivize Israel um, to, to 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 grant Palestinians their national rights, and it was a way of of increasing Palestinian negotiating leverage in order to do that. Right, by now, it's a reward, it's a privilege by giving it to Israel without Israel having to give anything in return. Um, and then calling it peace is basically um, is basically obscuring the fact that you know Israel doesn't have to do much to normalize relations, but doesn't want to do anything at all. And what Bahrain and the UAE um, has done is not just betrayed Palestinians, but now become part of that apparatus. And then lastly, the last thing I'll say is just to indicate that this is uh, Bahrain is now the fourth country to normalize relations uh, with Israel, Egypt, Jordan, the UAE, Bahrain. None of them, none of them 
have exacted any enduring concessions for Palestinians. Um, in the course of their negotiations, Egypt did recoup uh, the Sinai Peninsula, but didn't was at, had the greatest potential to exact Palestinian national rights, failed to do so. Uh, Jordan didn't do um, any of that as they were seen as basically um, reneging the rights, which now belong to Palestinians in the aftermath of the Declaration of Principles. And Bahrain, and the UAE, I think, is part of something more to come, um, which basically indicates for us a very harsh reality for Arabs who are all, all um, still, you know, struggling uh, for for their own freedom. And and we were reminded of that when Bahrainis took to you know social media to tweet and trend Bahrainis against normalization. Because they too are are in a struggle against their own uh, regime, which now has the benefit of U.S. military support and impunity that the U.S. is sure to provide in international fora like the UN Security Council. Um, thank you so much for that very comprehensive response. Um, I thought we should end on a hopeful note about the future. And Elena here has an excellent question around what does an anti-police future look like to you? Um, she mentions that although the Minneapolis City Council has disbanded their police department, they've contracted private security details instead. Is this a blue washed step towards abolition? And what would you consider to be an anti-police future? I think all of us need to be asking that question about what, you know, what is an, what does an abolitionist future look like? What does a decolonial future look like, right? Um, and I think that so many activists have actually shown us what that future is. We've seen it in the form of mutual aid, of an increasing interdependence on one another. The fact that um, we have been so socially isolated and atomized from one another is a deliberate, it has been a deliberate part of, you know, neoliberalism's entrenchment in our life, right? Which, which allows us to believe that we can survive in isolation um, from a broader society within which we're interdependent. So I think part of, of an anti-policing future is us you know, overcoming capitalism, us slowing down significantly, where we replace the value of efficiency and productivity with a different set of values about um, how much we are able to survive in in um, cooperation and interdependence. I also think that, you know, part of overcoming the first and the second means that we also ascribe different values, the real value of something um, to, to those things that we care about. So for example, within a capitalist, you know, rendering you spending time with your grandmother um, watching a television show has no value, has no economic value. And yet these are the very things um, that we fight for. And so things are not given their proper weight and value. And I think that's also part of, of our abolitionist work which is to overcome capitalism in the ways that it dehumanizes us, ascribes the wrong values to the wrong things. It's not giving the real value. It's giving you know, a market value um, that I, is quite inaccurate and violent. Um, and I think in terms of the policing itself that you're asking about, right, um, we, we, have, we have used, in the United States especially, used police in the place of, of a welfare program. We refuse, and so our struggle in the US might look different than others elsewhere in the world, but you know our largest mental institution in the U.S. is a, is a prison, right? So there are things that I think are going to look like gradual steps of certain sending out first responders, sending out EMTs, sending out uh, clinical therapists, sending out people who are trained to respond to conditions, rather than constantly relying on the police um, um, to do that, and then to give them, you know qualified immunity um, and untold amounts of power in or that they can abuse. Um, and, and there's many ways that we can detail this and abolitionists who are, you know, committed abolitionists who have written and studied this can provide you with the resources um, and thinking through that. And I think Critical Resistance is one such organization that does that, um, but also, you know, authors like obviously Angela Davis of The Prison is Obsolete, as well as uh, Ruthie Wilson Gilmore of The Golden Gulag ha are two of many who provide us, Dylan Rodriguez and, and others who provide us with ways to think about abolition isn't necessarily a dream, decolonialism isn't necessarily a dream, it's a, it's a plan of action.
Great. I'm very glad we ended on that question. Um, thank you to everybody who joined us today. We had over 100 people. Thank you to all the excellent questions. I'm very sorry if I didn't get to every single one of them, but I was trying to get the largest links we can. Events. Uh, please follow the series, the hashtags, uh, SOAS, SOAS alumni, we are SOAS. You'll be able to also hear about other events in the Continuing the Conversation series um, on the website, and you can get tickets for those. Um, if you have any questions about this event or future events, feel free to email events at soas.ac.uk if you'd like to discuss anything further. Um, and of course, I'd like to end by profusely thanking Noura. It's always such a pleasure and an honor to hear you speak. Um, I know it's been a difficult few months and you, as I've emailed you and said, have stood proud, made us all proud of everything you've been able to achieve and speaking truth to power throughout this time. Um, thanks to everyone who attended and uh, speak to you soon, Noura. Bye. Thank you so much, Rafi.